David meets Goliath situation. The United States were preparing to detonate a nuclear bomb on Chitka Island as part of its nuclear weapons testing program. Located in Alaska, Chitka Island was also home to a vast number of endangered animal species. Back in Vancouver, a small group of protesters felt that enough was enough. On October 16, 1970, they held a benefit concert at the Pacific Coliseum to raise enough money to charter a boat and sail to Alaska. They wanted to raise awareness and let the world know of what was happening. Later that month, they set sail for Alaska on a boat named the Phyllis Cormac determined to make a difference. They planned to sail right into the blast zone and dare the United States to blow up the bomb. Nobody had heard of them yet, but little did the world know that they were to become the first members of Greenpeace, an organization which is now the most famous environmental group in the world. Unfortunately, the protesters at Amchitka Island ultimately failed. Bad weather had thrown the plan off course, and the United States ended up detonating their nuclear explosives in the North Pacific. Nonetheless, their mark had already been made. Their efforts had attracted so much publicity from around the world, and had sparked so many anti-nuclear testing protests worldwide, that the United States announced that it would stop testing nuclear bombs in Alaska. After this victory, Greenpeace expanded their organization to pursue a wider range of environmental issues. However, their methods remained the same. They used dramatic and often dangerous stunts to stop what they believed to be crimes against the environment. Throughout the 1970s, they fought for nuclear disarmament in countries across the world, most notably France. In 1972, the French government had planned to test its nuclear weapons in French Polynesia. Had the weapons been detonated, radiation would have been released into the atmosphere for thousands of kilometers, affecting wildlife for many, many years into the future. Fortunately, Greenpeace boldly stepped in before the nuclear weapons went off under the leadership of David McTaggart. Like the activists in the Amchitka Island protest, McTaggart anchored his yacht, the Vega, at Mororoa, well in range of the nuclear blast radius. He was defiantly reluctant to move. However, this time, things turned for the worse. After several days of silent protest, the French military invaded the Vega, beating McTaggart and his crew so badly that McTaggart lost vision in one of his eyes. Although the French government originally tried to deny its involvement, smuggled photographs soon surfaced regarding the assault, which both embarrassed and put pressure on the French government to take action. After about a decade, the French government finally decided to terminate its nuclear weapons testing program in the South Pacific. mid-1970s, the original members of Greenpeace began to turn their attention to new issues, namely commercial whaling, seal hunting, and toxic waste. In order to combat the masses of Soviet whalers off the coast of California, they continued with the radical, audacious traditions of creating awareness. Greenpeace activists began navigating their vessels between whaling boats and whales, 
forcing the whalers to risk shooting and killing Greenpeace protesters with their harpoons in the process of trying to hunt whales. In fact, this method gained so much notoriety that it still continues today, albeit in a less radical form, in the fight against the Japanese whaling industry. Put in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel that was bearing down on us, and in front of us is their eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time the uh, harpooner tried to get a shot, I was at the helm, so I would maneuver the boat to try and block the uh, harpoon. We are right between the Soviet ship and the whales, and Bob is looking at, at the harpooner, and the harpooner's not shooting, but somebody from the bridge talks to the harpooner, and the harpooner nods, and Bob looks in his eyes, and he knows this guy's going to shoot this harpooner. Suddenly there's this incredible explosion and this uh, harpoon flew over our head and slammed into the backside of uh, one of the whales and, and she screamed. The whalers purposefully shoot at a female first because they know that the bull whales will attack them. And then when the bull whales come to attack them, which is exactly what happened. He was waiting for them and uh, very nonchalantly pulled the trigger and sent a second harpoon into the head of the whale and he screamed and fell back and now the water is full of blood everywhere from the two dying whales. And as this whale lay and uh, you know, rolled in agony on the surface of the, the ocean, I, I caught his eye and he looked straight at me. And we're looking right into this eye, which is about this big, it's huge. And we're looking into the eye of this huge sperm whale and I, I have to tell you, it, it's sort of beyond emotional. You know, when you, there's certain moments that are so emotional, you're just in brand new territory. I began to think, why were the Russians killing the whales? You know, they didn't eat sperm whale meat, uh, but they did use the spermaceti oil to make um, high heat resistant lubricating oil for, for machinery. And one of the pieces of machinery that they used it in is the manufacture of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said, here we are destroying this incredibly beautiful, intelligent, socially complex creature for the, for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass destruction of humanity. And that's when I, I came to me with a, you know, like a flash that we're, we're insane. We're just totally insane. And from that moment on, I decided that I work for whales. I work for seals. I work for sea turtles and fish and seabirds. I don't work for people. My idea was that if you, if you took an image and you passed it through the media into the mass mind, you could essentially blow the mass mind with new images that would create whole new ways of looking at the world. And, and the image of small whales up against giant whaling machines uh, was a mind bomb. Greenpeace didn't do these daredevil stunts for the sole purpose of saving individual whales and seals. They did them to create awareness about their causes. Robert Hunter, one of the founders of Greenpeace, once stated, If a mass awareness developed about the seal problem, the problem would be solved. If crazy stunts were required in order to draw the focus of the cameras that led back into millions and millions of brains, then crazy stunts are what we would do. By the end of the decade, Greenpeace had evolved from a local Vancouverite grassroots initiative into a worldwide international organization. By 1977, more than 15 Greenpeace groups existed in various countries around the world. And finally, on October 14, 1979, Greenpeace International was formed. Greenpeace International represented an international organization which was responsible for directing the overall movement of all the regional offices throughout the world. In fact, this organization still exists today, raising awareness to the public about environmental issues and trying to give a voice to voiceless Mother Nature.